Last week, we talked about being um, better in works and love. And I wanted just to kind of share something really quick, uh, just kind of a just real short recap. And when I say short, I'm only going to give you one portion. Because I said being better in works and better in love, we came out of Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 10. We're going to be going to verse number 11 for this message. But I want you to just to hear the summary of last week's message and the summary of that verse. Number one, God is just. How many of us believe that? Amen. He sees our work and he sees our love. How many of y'all know we serve the God who sees? God sees all. And then our work comes as a result of our love for God. In Hebrews 6.10, it said that he sees your work and your love that you are basically doing, um, you're doing because of him. It says, your work and your love shown for his name. So in other words, our work and our love is done as a result of loving God. So our work comes as a result of loving God, and our love for God results in us serving the saints. Listen to it again. Our work comes as a result of loving God, and our love for God results in serving. So when we love God, we're going to serve. Because how many of y'all know God serves? Amen. Jesus, even when he washed the disciples' feet, what did it say? It said that he um, sent them out and said, hey, now you go and do likewise, right? So when we look at this and we talk about better, how many of y'all want to get better? I do. I want to get better. I even went to a, uh, a cohort yesterday that's going to last the entire year. Most of it's going to be online, but it's an opportunity for me to even get better. I'm going to be sharing a lot of that with our uh, staff here, our team here, and our leadership here. But um, this morning, I want to I want to share a message with you, part one, and I've entitled this message "A Better Assurance." Let me ask you this: Have you ever boarded a plane that you were unsure would make it to its destination? I mean, you you just kind of got on it anyway. Have you ever gotten on an elevator? that you were unsure would make it to the 15th floor without plummeting to the ground and squashing you like a pancake. I mean, how many of y'all are like, man, give me that elevator. You know, they got six elevators in the lobby and you choose the one that says under construction. Did you leave the house this morning without being pretty sure you would make it to this building for worship today? In other words, you were probably 999 Nine, nine percent sure that you were going to make it. In other words, most of us make safe choices in life, don't we? We know accidents happen, but if there is a doubt we would make it to our destination, most of us wouldn't get on the plane. If this morning we got up and we were told by the mechanic that if we start our car today, there is a chance that it will blow up. Most of us would have stayed at home, watched the worship service online until our car got fixed. Am I correct on this? Until our car got fixed to ensure that we would make it to our destination and not become a crispy critter. In other words, we live our lives with a pretty good assurance that things will work the way they are supposed to work. But we also know that accidents still happen. Is that not true? So there is only so much assurance that we can have in man-made things of this world. I drove down to Griffin, Georgia yesterday um, for the cohort. Also picked my mom up. She's with us this morning in the back. But I drove to Griffin yesterday and witnessed firsthand some of the damage that was done by the storms that came through this past week. Uh, My sister said, hey, send me some footage. There were huge beams of metal that were put up that people were pretty sure would remain for years to come, but all that changed when tornadoes ripped through that city. Those uh, that were once straight metal beams were now twisted, mangled mess of metal, and it was all from wind. Isn't that amazing? Some of the things of this world, so and the things of this world, the tangible things, even the mechanical things of this world, the material things, all of these things are temporal. And we don't have 100% assurance assurance in them. We trust to the degree that we know. That's what we do. 
That's why we get on the plane. We didn't know what the mechanic signed off on. That's why we drive our car. That's why when we hit our brake pedal, we anticipate that it will work. Am I correct on that? And when we hit the gas, hallelujah. All right. But we still don't know what will really happen. So we live our life as safe as possible. But we as believers know this, that full assurance only comes from trusting the Lord. Absolutely, 100% full assurance only comes from trusting God. How many of you have ever trusted in something besides God since you've become a believer? Don't you lie to me. Trusted in your job, you trusted in your bank account. You trusted in your abilities, you trusted in your talent, you trusted in all of these things. But how many of you have learned over time, and I promise you I did, have learned over time that all of those things are still not 100% trustworthy? The full assurance is in God. The full assurance is in God. I got to tell you something. I walked away from a position at a church not knowing where I would go, but with full assurance that God had given me the okay to do so. And I'm telling you, he took care of our family. I don't take, I'm not presumptuous on that. I just know God took care of our family. My father-in-law was not quite convinced that I had made the right move. Although he, he knew I was trusting God, but I just remember, maybe it was my own guilt because I just remember meeting my father-in-law after I had resigned, just looking at him going, what are you going to do for my daughter and these kids? I said, well, I'm just going to come to you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but listen, I want us, I want to share with you today about living an assured life. We can live an assured life in the Lord. And that's why I titled this A Better Assurance. I want to begin with Hebrews chapter 6, and I want to start with verse number 11. We're only going to do 11 and 12, so I'm going to read both of them now. It says, and we desire each one of you, everybody say each one of you, to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Listen to it one more time. We desire that who? Each one of you, for each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The first thing that I want us to see is the writer of Hebrews addresses each one of you. Look at somebody and say, you're a you. (laughs) You're a you. Individually, he says, we desire each one of you. He doesn't say we desire you collectively. He says we want each one of you. The writer continues in this theme of individuals instead of collectively addressing the believers, and I think that's important to note, because God knows you. Do you hear me? He said, we want each one of you. I really like William Barclay's commentary, and I want to read to you from it about this passage. He said, further, his very form of speaking shows, his, it shows how individual his love is. He said, we hope that each one of you will display the zeal that will make your hope come true. He's reading out of a different version of scripture. He goes on to write and he says this, he is not thinking of them as a crowd, but as individual men and women. Dr. Paul Tonier in a doctor's case book has a paragraph on what he calls personalism of the Bible. He says, God says to Moses, I know you by name. He says to Cyrus, it is I, the Lord, who call you by your name. So if we take this in the context of even what scripture says, even in the Old Testament, then what God says to us is I call Tim by name. I call Harry by name. I call Abigail by name. I call Ruth by name. 
So in this, he says, I, I, one is struck on the Bible on when they're reading the Bible by the importance of its personal names. Barclay goes on to write, he says, whole chapters are devoted to long genealogies. How many of y'all get tired of hearing who begot who? Because you can't even pronounce the begots. I mean, you can only pronounce the word begot. The names are a blur. He said, when I was young, I used to think that they could have well have dropped that from the biblical canon. But I have since realized that these series of proper names bear witness to the fact that in the biblical perspective, man is neither a thing nor an abstraction. He is not a fraction of mass as the Marxists say that he is, but he is a person. You are an individual that God saw and gave his grace and his mercy to. There's not a person on this planet, I believe this, that God does not know their name and has longed for them to come to him. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Whew. I was in my office this morning and there's a song and I was just listening to, I was like, wow, God, you like saved me. This finite human being who will only be on this earth for a span of time, you saved me. <laughs> you saved me. And he loves us with an unconditional love. How many of y'all, even since you've been saved, you've wondered, man, does God really love me? How many of y'all have sat along with, uh, with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, or oh, wretched woman that I am, oh, wretched creature, God, how could you love me? Did you see the attitude I just displayed? How many of y'all have ever done that? Many of y'all have ever thought, God, you love me out of what? I loved you from the beginning. That's what God says. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I created you. Wow. He goes on to write, he says, when the writer to the Hebrews wrote with sternness and even encouragement, he was not rebuking a church. Listen to what he says. He was yearning over individual men and women as God himself does. I knew this was gonna be one of those sermons. I was sitting beside a friend of mine yesterday at this meeting. And uh, during the worship time, one of the pastors, Pastor Tim Gross, who's preached here before, he got up and he said, hey, he said, if, if any of you have got a burden on your heart or something, he said, just lift your hand. He said, you know how we do in service. He said, now, if you're beside somebody and their hands up, go over, lay your hands on them, pray for them. So I'm just praying for my friend. And he said to me afterwards, he said, <laughs> he said, my wife's twin sister died last week of pancreatic cancer. Young woman, young woman. He said, she's gone down to be with her kids. They're in college in Florida. He said, she's gone down to be with her kids. He said, just, just pray for her. You know me, I mean, I prayed for him. And, and then this morning, I'm sitting in my office. <laughs> and the grief kind of welled up inside of me for that family. I'm thinking this woman lost her twin sister. I mean, I've heard about twins, how connected they are. I'm like, what a reality to lose your sister whom you grew with in the womb. Think of this. It's hard to lose even a, a, a sibling no matter what, but I'm thinking and I'm just touched by that grief and I'm like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> but I texted him and I said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I'm touched by your grief 
this morning. I prayed for you yesterday, but this morning I am touched by the grief. But you know what? Her sister is in heaven and that's where we all long to be. So we will all be gathered around that throne one day soon, worshiping God together. But I felt like the Lord just said to me, here, let me show you how I feel when you grieve. Wow. Hebrews 6, 11 goes on to say this. He says, first off, he begins, he says, as we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness. Listen to those words. The same what? Earnestness. That word earnestness means this, to strive after anything. Remember when Paul said, hey, letting go of what is behind me, I press toward the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. It says to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Amen? It's like, listen, there are times, or there are not times where you have to press in your faith. He said this, he said, show the same earnestness, striving after. That word almost means, also means giving diligence. Listen to what it says. Careful and persistent work or effort. Show the same careful and persistent work or effort. This is hard, but it's vital. It's vital to keep up careful and persistent work. I think we all know it's easy to settle back into our routines when we start to see results from the work that we put in. That's why most gyms are full in January and February. The reason that we are seeing the results, though, is because of the careful and persistent work that we're putting in. Now, I'm not telling you, we're not saved by works, but if we want to press in, it's going to be hard for some of us to fast this week. Am I correct on that? You're going to go, because here's the thing, we are in a routine of eating. You are... Most men are thinking about what they're going to eat for lunch after they eat breakfast. Or around nine o'clock, your little ding, ding, ding. I mean, I know I'm texting Karen. Do I need to pick something up or do we have something? She says, well, I don't know if you'll like what we're having. And I'm like, well, Publix chicken. Okay, but here we go. But listen, but we, what will happen is, is if we don't, continue to press, if we settle back into our old routine, we're going back to what was not to the better. So sometimes we have to put away to press forward. Sometimes we have to change our routine. You know, and it's very hard to teach an old dog new tricks, isn't it? How many of y'all are in a routine right now? You have a routine. And if somebody gets you out of that routine, you go cuckoo. If we're on a diet, what will happen is going back to our routine keeps us from getting better because we go back to butter. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews continues in Hebrews 6.11. He says, hey, have, the, have that assurance and then he said, have that earnestness, the same earnestness. Then he says to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Full assurance, what does that mean? That means most certain confidence. Most certain confidence. Hope means joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Confident, joyful and confident expectation. Here's what I believe the writer of Hebrews is trying to do, which we know the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired, but the writer is the one who put the pen to it. But listen, I think the writer is encouraging people to move past feelings. Did y'all just hear what I said? Y'all didn't catch it because most of us want a feeling. One of the things that uh, Dr. Sam Chan said in the session that I was in yesterday, he said this, he said, most of us build monuments off of experience. I thought, oh. He said, we go back to the experience. 
Jacob went back to the experience when he laid his head on the pillar and the, he saw the angels descending and ascending, right? And he said, oh, this is the house of God. This is the doorway to heaven. He anointed the rock, but guess what? When he went back to that rock, that rock wasn't the same. He had to go to a different place and have a different encounter with God. Many of our first encounters with the Lord, kind of easy. They can run on a feeling, but you know what? Faith doesn't run on feeling. Faith is faith. Faith is confidence. It's steadfast. Listen to what it says again. Full assurance, most certain confidence of what? Hope joyful and confident expectation of what is to come. He says to have full assurance of hope until the end. Now, this is when the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen. The rubber doesn't meet the road until your, <laughs> until your experience doesn't line up with your faith. The rubber meets the road, hear me, when your experience doesn't line up with your faith. In other words, God didn't answer the prayer like you wanted him to. God didn't do what you asked him to do. It wasn't instantaneous. Well, Lord, last time, but this time, no. He didn't answer the same way. How many of us does our faith get shaken? Our confidence gets shaken. Our full assurance gets shaken. But here's what, here's what the writer's saying. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Be confident in the hope. Be confident in the hope. Be confident in the hope. It becomes real. I was talking with Pastor Damien, who lost his wife. Y'all know I've shared about him on a number of times. I'm kind of walking with him through this faith journey. I'm grieving with him. I'll tell him many times I have nothing to say. I have no words, but just know I'm here if you ever need an ear. They got back after the holidays were over. He said, man, now things are beginning to get raw. We're beginning to go through some things. He said, man, I was so mad at God last night. I said, that's okay. Be as mad as you need to be because God can handle it. Amen. Say whatever you need to say because God can handle it. I said, I have no idea what you're feeling. Today, this morning, Pastor Damien is in, uh, in Illinois preaching the 10th anniversary of the church he and his wife and family planted. So Heavenly Father, we pray for him right now. Lord, I don't know how he's preaching or what time he's preaching, but Father God, we just lift that church to you, that body to you, lift Pastor Damien to you, lift his children to you, God, lift the extended family to you. Father God, we just pray now, Lord, that many people will be touched through this message. We ask you for it in Jesus' name, amen. But he said to me, man, this is real. So many emotions. I texted with him yesterday. So many emotions running through my mind. I said, I, I have, I always, I, I just say that I have no words. I've never lost a spouse. I have no words. He said, but you know what? He said this on his Facebook post. Here's what he said. He said, I just got through preparing the message. It was a good exercise for me because it's reminding me of what I truly believe. Because the feelings will tell you one thing. Yes. Have y'all ever heard feelings before? Can I tell you something? Your feelings will lie to you in a minute. Yes. But faith stands firmly on the confidence and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen on that? Hey, I don't believe what I see, Lord. I'm trusting what your word says. I'm believing you, God, that I can speak those things to be not as though they are. Hmm. Barclay said this, listen to these. And I've got my little tidbit in here. Barclay gives a commentary on this message because the persistent work of faith can sometimes leave us dry. Anybody here ever been dry in your faith? Maybe wondering, is this even worth it? But that's like saying I'm going to give up on my marriage because I don't feel like I did when we first met. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. That wore off quickly. <laughs> Didn't it? I'm going to give up on my marriage because I don't feel like I did when we first met. If that were the case, I guess all of us would be divorced now. 
Because sometimes it's the work of marriage, not the feeling of marriage. Some of the best advice somebody gave me was what their father gave them. They said, in your marriage, you will fall in and out of love very many times. But my marriage is not based on feeling love. My marriage is based on loving my wife. He said this, when we learn that even if these people, speaking of those that are written to in Hebrews 6, even if these people to whom he is writing have failed to grow in their Christian faith and knowledge, even if they have been falling away from their first enthusiasm, they never gave up on their practical service to other believers in God's name. Listen to what he continues. He said, there is a great practical truth here. Sometimes in the Christian life, we can come to times which are arid, empty, dry. The church services have nothing to say to us. The teaching we do has nothing to say to us. The teaching we hear has nothing to say. The singing that we do, or even the service that we, when we're serving on a committee or doing an outreach becomes a labor without joy. Now, if you've been a believer for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. He says, at such a time, there are two alternatives. We can give up on our worship and our service, but if we do, we are lost. He says, or we can go determinedly on with them and the strange thing is that the light and the romance and the joy will in time come back again. In the end times, the best thing to do is to go on with the habits of the Christian life and the church. If we do, we can be sure that the sun will shine again. You know, uh, Dr. Chan said yesterday in the, in, the, in the message, he said, hey, he said, some of y'all are trying to go back to what was. Y'all are trying to think pre-pandemic. Y'all are wondering where, he said, y'all are still wondering where the people are that never came back to your church. He said, guess what? They're never coming back. So you need to go from what was to what is and then trust God for what is to come. Amen? So you know what? So listen, listen, that was the experience we had then. What's the experience we're having now? As for me and my house, I can't worry about what, else, what someone else does. I can encourage them, say, hey, you ought to get back into a fellowship, whether it's here or somewhere else, get into a fellowship of believers. I'm gonna tell you something. The enemy is out to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And if he can separate us, Jesus didn't ever go after the herd of sheep. He or the flock of sheep. He went after the lost sheep. He went after the one that was isolated away from everyone else. So if you think, oh, I can live this Christian life in isolation, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. You cannot live it in isolation. I'm not saying that you can't still serve God. You can't still be online if you're inhibited from being around others. But I'm gonna tell you something. Our fellowship comes when we are fellowshipping one with another in the name of Jesus. Where That's why he said, wherever two or more are gathered together in my name. Have a lady who's bedridden or, or homebound. She can't get out. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, I am calling other people and I am singing them songs. And I am singing hymns to them and playing the keyboard to them. And I am worshiping God from my house. I'm encouraging people. Some of us are just dry as dead toast right now. Dead toast, dead toast is dead. And okay, dry as toast, there we go. Take the dead out and I had it right. But what we need to do, listen to me, is we, how many of y'all need, you need the joy of your salvation to return? You've kind of set back sometimes and you're kind of like, man, I'm in that dry, arid place and I don't like it. Then you know what? Lift your hands to God 
because the scripture says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So God, I'm coming. It says you're enthroned on my praises. So heavenly father, I'm praising you. I'm magnifying you. I'm trusting you. It says, God, you'll pour out your latter rain in the last days. I trust him for that. Do you hear that? That's a confidence. That's a hope. That's a full assurance. Hebrews chapter six, verse 12 says this. He says, all this earnestness, the work, the striving in spiritual things, the assurance, the confidence, the full confidence in God is to do what? It is so that we may not become sluggish, (laughs) but be imitators, listen to it, of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I'm gonna ask our worship team to come if they will. So that you may not be what? Sluggish, dull, slow, slothful. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It's interesting to me right here that the writer calls the New Testament believers to look at the Old Testament saints as examples. Did y'all hear that? He tells the New Testament believers to look at Old Testament saints as the examples of faith and to imitate their faith because it was through faith, and listen to this word, we love this word, don't we? And patience. (laughs) Faith and patience that they inherited the promises. I'm gonna read the last part of Barclay's commentary. And I wanna give him all the credit because I, I wouldn't be quite smart enough to write as he did. It says, he tells his people to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promise. What he is saying to them is this, you are not the first to launch out on the glories and the perils of faith. Did y'all hear that? You're not the first. You won't be the last. You're not the first to launch out on the glories and the perils of faith. Others braved the dangers and endured the tribulations before you and I were here. They endured the tribulations, but they won. He says he is telling these believers to go on in the realization that others have gone through their struggles and won the victory. I don't care what your struggle is. There's not a struggle that Jesus didn't die on that cross for. There's not a struggle that God did not say it is finished. There's not a struggle in scripture, come on, that you, that you are going through right now that God doesn't have, doesn't have, that we can't have, sorry, that we can't have full confidence in God to meet it. I believe that with all of my heart. I don't know about you. How many of y'all have had financial struggles and God's brought you through? Somebody? How many of y'all have had health issues and God's brought you through? How many of y'all have had family issues and God's brought you through? How many of y'all have been through tough times in marriage and God's brought you through? How many of y'all have had in-law problems? Not me, but God brought you through. How many of y'all have had parental parenting problems and God brought you through? We're not perfect, but he is. We're not perfect, but he is. The last portion of this, stand to your feet with me if you will. He said, the Christian is not treading an untrodden pathway. He is treading where the saints have already trod. Wow. Mm. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah, we magnify you, God. Come on, just thank him right now. Hallelujah, Lord. We glorify your name. We magnify you, Heavenly Father. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to listen to the words of this song as I close. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation and purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Listen, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending from heaven above, echoes of mercy and whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's give him praise. Come on, come on, give him praise this morning.